Well, welcome everyone. Um, great to have you all with us here tonight as we venture into a little different part of town than we're normally in, but it's a great restaurant, a great space, and uh, we're having some great food and drink here tonight, so glad you're with us. Uh, speaking of food and drink, there's plenty more food, and I think the advertisement said we'd spring for one drink. We'll go ahead and do a couple tonight if you want to, so feel free to, to go grab a second one. <laughs> Uh, as we go through tonight. But my name is Kyle Wingfield. Uh, I'm the president of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. And it's my pleasure to get to host events like this and get to have great speakers like we're going to have tonight um, and then a great discussion out of that. So uh, if you don't know much about us, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, education and research center based here in Atlanta. We, we work on a number of issues education, health care, transportation, tax, criminal justice reform, uh, just to name a few of them. Uh, we do that from a perspective of uh, limited government, free enterprise, personal responsibility. Those are our values. But we, like I said, we're a research institute, so we collect facts, uh, we, and we go where they lead us. Uh, and that's how we operate. Uh, we have one upcoming event after this. We've just been through a string of them. Uh, but our biggest event of the year, our annual Georgia Legislative Policy Forum, will be on Friday, November 15th. It'll be up uh, at the Renaissance Atlanta Waverly Hotel, which is next to the uh, Cobb Galleria. That's a all, nearly all-day event. We'll begin with breakfast at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, we'll have a welcome from the Lieutenant Governor, Jeff Duncan. We'll have a keynote speech at breakfast on early childhood education. We'll have a panel on uh, education and school choice, a panel on transportation and mobility in the 21st century. Uh, we'll have a presentation from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University on uh, how strict and uh, the regulations and laws are in Georgia. They've got an artificial intelligence program that they put together to scan the entire state code and use an algorithm to decide if we're a relatively strict or relatively lenient state when it comes to our laws. So it should be very interesting to hear the results of that. We'll have uh, a presentation from Governor Kemp's Georgians First Commission, which has been tasked with making Georgia the best state for small business. And they've spent this year uh, with, with some task forces looking at certain areas like occupational licensing reform, and they're going to be presenting their recommendations for the legislature there. Um, We'll have a keynote speech for lunch. All I can say at the moment is we've invited Governor Kemp to give that speech. We're awaiting confirmation on that. Um, but after lunch, we'll delve into health care, and we'll be talking about the health care reforms uh, that his administration is proposing, which could be really wide-ranging and, uh, and, and very important for the state of Georgia. And we'll close with, uh, with thoughts from Speaker David Rawson. So it's a jam-packed schedule. Uh, we cover a lot of ground, but it really is the opening shot to the legislative session, and we hope you'll all join us there for that on Friday, November 15th. Um, you'll notice on your table there's a there's a commentary about that that our Vice President, Benita Dodd, wrote. Uh, there's also some information about us and what we do and how we operate. Uh, we are privately funded. We neither accept nor solicit any government funding. Uh, if you're so moved by what we do here tonight and the, the kind of uh, program that we put on, we would appreciate your financial support, and you're welcome to ask uh, our, our folks here um, any questions you may have about how, who we are and how we operate now. But I want to get to the, um, to the main event here and the reason we're all gathered, um, and that is our speaker, Jenna Robinson. Uh, she is uh, the head of the... Um, Martin Center for Academic Renewal in North Carolina. She joined the Martin Center in January 2007 as campus outreach coordinator and later became the center's director of outreach. She was previously the E.A. Morris Fellowship Assistant at the John Locke Foundation, one of our sister think tanks uh, in North Carolina, where she had worked since 2001. Uh, she is a graduate of NC State University, her degrees in political science and French, she studied at the University of East Anglia School of American Studies in Norwich in the United Kingdom. She received her master's degree in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
and her PhD in political science with a concentration in American politics and a minor in methods from UNC Chapel Hill. She's also a graduate of the Koch Associate Program sponsored by the Charles Koch Foundation. Her work has appeared in Investors Business Daily, Roll Call, Forbes, American Thinker, Human Events, The Carolina Journal, The Lincoln Tribune, The Hickory Daily Record, The Gaston Gazette, The Mountain Express, and The News and Observer in Raleigh. I think that's more newspapers that I, as a former, than I, as a former journalist, have been published in. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, she's taught courses in American politics at UNC Chapel Hill, at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Wake Technical Community College. Um, and she's testified before Congress on the federal Pell Grant program. Um, she lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with her husband, two sons, and two cats. And with that, it's time for her to tell us uh, some thoughts on how we can tackle these problems of college costs and student debt. So, Jenna, thank you. Thank you. I am really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm a little bit jealous that you can have an event that kicks off your legislative session because in Raleigh, it just goes on forever. They're still there from the last session. So I, I am a little bit jealous of that. So thank you all for having me here tonight. Thank you to Benita Dodd for inviting me and to the Georgia Public Policy Foundation for hosting this event. Um, Tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is separating fact from fiction on student loans. Obviously, there is a lot of interest in student loans in the media right now. And I want to drill down and look at, you know, what are the real problems that student loans create for people? And what are the potential solutions to those problems? But before I get started, I'll tell you a little bit about the Martin Center where I work. We do research and advocacy on higher education issues at the state and local level. But obviously, since I'm talking about student loans, we dabble in national issues as well. Uh, we're particularly interested in transparent and responsible governance, in viewpoint diversity and academic quality, in cost-effective education solutions, and in market-based reforms. And also, as I was telling some of you over dinner, in athletics. And that, that gets its, it, it has its own topic entirely. Um, and tonight I'm going to, like I said, talk about student debt, and it is a really hot topic. I took the shuttle over here tonight from my hotel and found out within about 30 seconds that everybody has opinions on student loans. Um, one of the men who I was riding on the shuttle with called his student debt his life partner. <laughs> he said he had been in a relationship with his student debt longer than any girlfriend. And so it's something that every Almost everybody is touched by, they've either had student loans or seen someone struggle with student loans or they're sending a child to college or they're helping a grandkid go to college. And so it's something that really does affect all of us, but not in the same way. And so I think it's important to look at not just the monolith of student loans, but look at the individual people and how they're affected and what those real problems are. And obviously we've seen in the Democratic primary that the biggest solution that is being pushed right now is uh, free college for all and debt forgiveness. And so hopefully throughout my talk, I'll be able to convince you that there are better solutions to the problem than those two. So as I said, um, student debt affects a lot of people. 65% of college seniors who graduated from public and private nonprofit colleges in 2018 had student loan debt. So 65% of people who are going to Duke University, Georgia Tech, UGA, they had student loan debt. They owed an average, when they graduated, these are undergrads, of $29,200, which is not an insignificant amount of money, but probably affordable if you've gotten a good job from your college education. Um, Georgia actually does better than the national average. I looked that up today. Normally I'm talking about North Carolina, which also does better than the national average. But Georgia, the average debt for a graduate here is $28,824, and only 57% of graduates from Georgia universities have student debt at all. So that, that's great. There are more than 40% of people graduating from Georgia universities with no debt. That's a fantastic accomplishment for Georgia. Um, what's a little bit more telling is that 88% of graduates from for-profit colleges took out student loans. 
and they graduated with an average of $39,000 in debt, actually closer to $40,000 in debt, and that was from a few years ago, so it has only gone up since then. Um, and what you've probably seen in the papers is that student loan debt now, total student loan debt for the country now eclipses credit card debt. It's the single largest source of debt other than home loans. Both tuition costs and debt have been increasing faster than the pace of inflation. And so the bottom line is that this is, this is a real problem. A lot of times the political juggernaut gets focused on things that are just a, you know, a tempest in a teapot, but this isn't the case. This is a real problem. Um, and not to be a cynic, but this is a real problem that likely voters care about because likely voters have gone to college. And so that's why it's something that's a hot topic in the presidential debates and in the media, because this is something that voters care about deeply. And like I said, the suggested solution is forgive the debt and free college for all. And as someone who's looked at higher education for a very long time, uh, I have to say very frankly, I think these are terrible ideas because they don't address the real problems. They don't address exclusively the people who are suffering, and it really it throws the baby out with the bathwater. And a little bit of investigation reveals why that is. Uh, and there are two, I think, separate problems, problems with higher education. One is that some people have excessively, or what seem like excessively high debt levels. Um, my organization ran an article a few years ago by a student named Kelly Space, and she also got national media attention. She had $200,000 in debt and a degree in sociology from Northeastern University in Boston. And she started a GoFundMe to try to pay it off. And she became, for a few months at least, kind of the poster child for the problem with excessively high levels of student debt. But the truth is that only 18% of all borrowers have more than $50,000 in debt. Having that amount of debt is not at all typical. And actually, it's not a significant problem for a different reason. And that is that higher debt levels are correlated with lucrative jobs. Lawyers, doctors, people who have gone on to graduate school and are getting jobs that easily can help them pay off their loans. And so I don't want anyone to sit around feeling bad because their oncologist had $300,000 to pay off. He will be fine. <laughs> and so that debt level alone, just looking at, oh, wow, we've got these people who have $200,000 in debt. Kelly Space is the exception. Most people who have $200,000 in debt did not get it from an undergraduate degree in sociology. Most of them went to grad school, law school, or medical school. And you should not waste any sympathy on that because they're doing great. The debt will be paid off quite shortly, and that is, that's from a study that was released by the Brookings Institution, if anyone wants to go and look it up. So the bigger problem, then, isn't that you hear about individuals with this sky high debt, because most of them are not in any trouble. The real problem, then, is inability to pay. People who are in default or who are making no headway on paying down their debt. And it's, it's a totally separate problem because the amount of debt you have and whether you can pay it back or not usually correlated. About 8 million borrowers have given up on paying more than $137 billion in education debts. And so that is a lot. Uh, at least one out of every six people who have any federal student debt haven't made a payment on their loans for at least nine months. And 1.1 million student borrowers defaulted for the first time in 2016. And that happens every year. The total amount of defaulted federal student debt grew by about 14% in 2016. And I'm sorry, I don't have more up-to-date uh, data than those. But I, as you can imagine, the problem continues in that fashion. We haven't made progress on it. Um, and lastly, and I think this is something a lot of people don't know, the federal government can actually garnish senior citizens' social security checks if they have defaulted on student loans. And they do so. Um, the government took 
$171 million in, student, in social security payments from older Americans who had defaulted on student debt in 2015. And so for the people who are unable to pay, this is a crisis. It, this is the real problem that we should be looking at. And it affects somewhere between 16 and 20% of all borrowers. And so that's why I say that forgiving all debt is throwing the baby out of the bathwater. If somewhere between 16 and 20% of borrowers are facing real hardship, then forgiving debt for everyone is not the solution we should be looking at. We should be looking at what caused this problem and how do we provide relief for the people who are unable to pay, who are facing hardship because of the debts that they've incurred. It's the proposal to forgive all debt is, when I look at it, it just seems like a feel-good money giveaway and it doesn't target the people who need it the most. And it's also a band-aid because it doesn't stop this problem from occurring again in the future. So we have to look at why the people who cannot pay back their loans, the graduates or the students who can't pay back their loans, these this 16 to 20% of people, you know, why are they having trouble paying back? And so one hypothesis is well, they borrowed too much. But as I said before, that's not usually the case. About a third of people who, love, who owe less than $5,000 in education debt uh, default. And so people are defaulting on small amounts. One out of three people are defaulting on debt that's less than $5,000 and they're defaulting quickly within four years of leaving school. Whereas only 15% of people who owe more than $35,000 are defaulting. Most of the defaults are occurring on, on small amounts of debt. So maybe the problem is then private student loans. And sometimes that's the case. They do have higher interest rates. But the majority of people do not take out private interest loans or private student loans. They're taking out loans from the government. They're taking out federal student loans. Another hypothesis is that students are getting degrees that are not paying back their effort. They're not paying for uh, for the money that was put in. And there is definitely a kernel of truth to this. The three biggest single sources of defaults in the U.S. are the University of Phoenix, ITT Technical Institute, and Kaplan University. And I don't believe that that's just because they are for-profit institutions. I believe it's because they are open enrollment institutions. And they don't care whether you are likely to succeed. They don't look at your grades in high school. They don't look at your ability to pay back your debt. They don't look at your SAT score. They don't make you write an essay. In other words, they have no idea if you are act actually a good fit for higher education, whether you're likely to benefit from the courses you're taking at all. And they aren't the only ones that treat students this way, that provide an open door not only to their courses, but also to bucket loads of debt down the line. But the last hypothesis I want to share is that failure, that failure to pay back student loans and default are related to students who have failed to graduate. 63% of borrowers in default have no degree. And 25% only have a certificate. This is by far the single biggest reason that people default on debt is that they go to a college and university and they don't make it out with anything to show for it. They go for maybe one, maybe two years, they take a few courses, and the university, all they cared about was getting the student through the door. They didn't follow up to see if that student was going to succeed, and they didn't put in the necessary work in the beginning to find out if it was the kind of student who was going to succeed. 
And so I, if I have to point my finger at the biggest culprit in the student loan dilemma, which I think is what this event is called tonight, it's colleges and universities themselves. They have, by extending federal money to everyone and not following up and not following through and not caring, created this problem. And yet, so far, they have seen no repercussions. Students still flock to universities. A lot of them don't look before they choose where they're going to go to see how many students actually graduate from this school that I'm going to. Do students actually get jobs when they leave this university I've chosen? Do they get jobs in their chosen major? Or are they working in retail? What's the default rate like at this university that I'm about to go to? And all of that information is publicly available and students could find out, but students are 18. And so we can't always rely on students to make that best informed decision. I wish they would, because I think a lot of them would choose differently than they do now. But what they would really find out is that, gosh, colleges are raking out a lot of money, and they're not fulfilling their promises to students. And so I think that any solution we talk about has to address this problem and has to point the finger at universities that are benefiting from, from the student loan crisis. They're not on the hook for this money. Individual students are on the hook for the money, or the taxpayers are on the hook for the money. The universities themselves have already gotten the tuition money from students. They've already gotten Pell Grant money from the federal government. And they don't have to pay it back. And so they benefit from opening their doors to students who they know can't succeed, or won't succeed, or who are unlikely to succeed. And so I think that we have to call universities to task. And there are a couple of ways I think that we can both prevent this problem from happening in the future and also address the graduates and non-graduates, former students who are suffering right now. So I'll start with a solution that will address the suffering and the problems and the hardship that's going on right now. And I think that solution is to make student loans subject to bankruptcy protections, which is how student loans in this country worked until 1995. And I think that most people don't realize that this was a huge sea change. Before, if you were really in a hole and you got to the point in your life where you were gonna declare bankruptcy, bankruptcy would wipe out all different types of debt, including student loan debt. But in 1995, that changed, and both federal and private sources of loans were protected from bankruptcy. So if you go bankrupt now, all of your other debt is wiped out. Your credit card debt, your car debt, your, your mortgage, you know, all of these things can be, you, you can declare bankruptcy and you don't have to pay as much on those debts. But you still have to pay your student loan. It really is your life partner. It's not going anywhere, even if you declare bankruptcy. I do think that that would have to be accompanied by a suitable waiting period. I don't want to encourage students to graduate from you know, an expensive private institution and turn around on their 22nd birthday and say, just kidding, they're declaring bankruptcy. Um, I think that would be you know, a terrible incentive for students, and so there should be some waiting period after, uh, after graduation or after leaving an institution that you have to wait before you declare bankruptcy. And that's, that is actually how it was pre-1995. And if you look at the data, pre-1995, the student debt, in aggregate, wasn't as big a problem. And you know, I don't have the detailed data to do a regression analysis and prove that this is the cause of the student debt problem, but I think it definitely plays into it. And if we do allow student loans to be discharged in bankruptcy, it'll give banks better incentives. Right now, they know they get paid back no matter what. 
even if you're 70, even if you have other debts, even if you are on Social Security, they're still getting their money. And that means that they will lend to anybody. Do you want to go to a school that costs $80,000 and major in, you know, underwater basket weaving, which is what my dad always said I was going to school for? Um, you can do that. The bank will lend you money for that. Um, but if they have better incentives, they'll be less likely to make loans to vulnerable 18 year olds who maybe should be making better decisions. So that's, that's my cure for the people who are having a hardship right now. But we also want to prevent this from happening in the future. We don't want to continue with you know, 20% of all borrowers for all time going into bankruptcy. That's, that's not a permanent solution. It puts incentives in the right place, but what we really need to do is prevent this from happening in the future. One thing I would suggest is to end parent plus loans. And so these are loans that after a, an undergraduate student has borrowed his or her limit from the federal government, the federal government will lend money to a parent to supplement. And so after the 18-year-old has given his you know, $35,000, $40,000 of federal money to his institution of choice, then mom and dad borrow more from the federal government and, and are on the hook for more. And if these loans were in the private market instead of federal loans, I think they would be labeled predatory loans because they are almost exclusively targeted at low-income parents. And when I suggest this, this solution, a lot of people will say, we won't that limit access? We won't that mean that low-income people in particular don't have access to colleges and universities? But we fortunately have a really great kind of accidental experiment that happened during uh, Obama's presidency. The education department during that time tightened up their credit work requirements for these parent plus loans very temporarily there was a big outcry. But when the credit requirements were tightened, schools that relied on these loans decreased their tuition almost immediately. And people who study economics of higher education were able to, they, they wrote a paper about this and showed that this was the case. If you don't, if you don't extend uh, credit, the colleges will, will make smart choices. They'll, they'll decrease their tuition because they do want to keep the students. So that's, that's my first solution for preventing part of the problem. My second solution, this has actually happened, so I'm thrilled, is to make Pell Grants available year-round. And the reason for that is that it helps students decrease their time to degree. If a student can go to school, fall, spring and summer without having to take breaks, they finish more quickly, and they are less likely to borrow larger amounts than they need. Summer is also a time when most dropouts happen. Uh, you see that there's very good retention between first semester and second semester, but once a student has left campus for summer, they're less likely to come back for that second year. And so by making Pell Grants available year-round, not increasing the total amount of Pell Grants, but just changing the way that they're given to students. You can help students stay in school, pay off that debt, graduate from school, opposite order, obviously, graduate, then pay off the debt. Um, but that's something that has actually already happened, so I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, we can also, and this is something that's being worked on, consolidate all loans into one program and consolidate all debt into one program. There is a lot of evidence that students don't know what they're borrowing. They, because it is coming from different programs and different sources, even within the federal government, students are unaware of the total amount of their debt until after they leave college and go to get a consolidation loan. And then they see it all in one place and they're like, holy moly, I have borrowed way more than I thought I had. And so by making the programs easier to navigate, it'll be easier for students to know what they're actually borrowing and how much of what they're borrowing is a loan and how much of it is a grant. Um, and that's some, there is a lot of talk 
in Washington about doing just that and also about making the FAFSA easier to navigate so people know a little bit better what they're getting into. Um, my next suggestion is that we begin using repayment data instead of default data to judge which schools are eligible for student loans. Because there's a trick that schools can do. They can encourage their graduates or the people who leave to go into deferment instead of paying immediately on their student loans. And this works out well for the schools because they know that somebody only gets counted in the official default rate if they default within three years. And so if someone leaves school and the loan advisor says, you should really go into deferment for a little bit, they're less likely to default within that critical three years where the federal government will actually catch them for it. So if we look at repayment data instead, those data show what are the percentage of people actually making progress on paying off their loans. And so it's just a better measurement that universities can't gain in order to look better than they actually are. Um, I've lost my place. Okay, so I've okay, got two more. Um, my second to last one is that we need to improve financial aid award letters. There was a big study a few years ago from the New America Foundation and they showed that they actually looked at award letters from various universities. And universities, when they write these award letters, they don't make it clear what is a grant and what is a loan and how much you actually are going to be on the hook for in the end. They make it look like this is a great deal. And if universities improved these award letters, and if you know a state university system, for example, insisted that its schools improve these award letters, students would know from the very beginning I am borrowing you know, $7,000 this year. I am borrowing $10,000 this year. They would realize how much of the money they're actually on the hook for instead of it all being lumped under the generic term of financial aid. Because that can mean a lot of things. And when you're 18 years old, you don't necessarily know that all of these different forms, mean, forms of aid mean different things. So we need to make those letters a lot better. We need to have transparency. I think the New America Foundation, when they did this report, did a wonderful service to show that these, these letters are not transparent particularly if this is the first time in your life that you've ever borrowed money or you've ever made a big financial decision, which is true if you are 18 years old. And the last suggestion I want to make is something called skin in the game. And this means that if a university has a lot of students who have defaulted on student loans, they are on the hook going forward for part of that money. And that means that universities will have much better incentives to behave better in the future. They'll have an incentive to accept qualified students. They'll have an incentive to encourage students to go into majors that will pay off. They will have incentives to reduce the time to degree. They'll have incentives to keep tuition low, not zero, but low enough so that it's something that more students can afford. And I think the beauty of the skin in the game solution is that it aligns universities' incentives with students' best interests. And right now, the incentives are not aligned. Universities' incentives are to increase their prestige, to maximize enrollment, and to maximize the money going into their pocketbook, regardless of the source. And I think that universities should be thinking of their students first, and not the maximum enrollment, or the bottom line. And so skin in the game accomplishes those goals. So in sum, I think that there are solutions for our student debt dilemma. Those solutions, we would have to do a lot of change, make a lot of changes. And we would have, we do have to address the people who are having hardship right now. It isn't just about changing the way we do things. It, it is also about addressing the problem as it exists today. Um, so with that, I will open it up for questions, and I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I was going to, I have one if, if people.
people were still formulating their thoughts. Go ahead. Yes. Quick question about the comment you made. Uh, 1995 mm -hmm. made a change, and I'm just curious. A lot of the for-profit colleges that exist today, I didn't know they even existed mm -hmm. back in the 90s. Was there a correlation, or is there a correlation between changing of policy that led to more for-profit colleges coming into being? You know, it, that very well could be. I have not actually looked into when did most for-profit colleges start to really ramp up in moment. You know, I know a lot of them kind of have been around for a long time. ITT Tech, I remember watching commercials for that back in the 80s. Um, so I do think they've certainly grown a lot. The University of Phoenix has grown exponentially. Um, but I don't know if anyone has done the research to find out, you know, is 1995 an inflection point on that? I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I haven't seen the data. A, a similar question, I mean, you talked about the change since those bankruptcy protections mm -hmm. changed. Um, and obviously things have taken off in terms of the number of people in trouble. Were there other structural changes along the way that you would point to, or did they all sort of unfold from that? one change uh, over time? We, there, there have been big structural changes going all back, all the way back to the 70s, because obviously before the 70s, we didn't have loans at all. And before the GI Bill, everybody just paid for college out of, out of their own pockets. But also before the GI Bill, the only people who went to college were people who were independently wealthy. And everyone for, you know, politicians, individuals, voters in this country have decided access is important. And so we do want to make sure that there's access. We don't want to go back to pre-GI Bill days. But we, we have to change something. And I think that really the best change is to go back to the pre-1995. <coughs> I think that was, it. that was a good equilibrium. Yes? I have a separate question, but I'll start with an easy one. Okay. Uh, Scholarships. Uh, I've really not studied the, the issue, but I've heard through the years that most of that money goes un, unused. You know, uh, and most scholarships, and this is anecdotal, I'm sure, from our, what I think, is targeted toward the high end GPA, you know, like 4.0s and 4.21s and, and all that. There are a few scholarships that you know, have different criteria where, uh, whatever. Uh, now maybe Pell, the Pell Grant's supposed to offset that for those of us that aren't, you know, road scholars. <laughs> but is there a way to look at the money that's in, and it has to be a lot of money that's not used in, in helping those that are in debt? That's my first question. Right, there, there is a lot of scholarship money that goes unused, because as you said, it, it does target very narrowly, and it isn't always just GPA. Sometimes it's you know someone who wants to go into a particular field who's from a particular city, and that is, it's just something that's hard to find. Um, I don't think that it could, you know, because it it goes unused maybe one year, but then it's used the next year. I I, I don't think that it could be a, a permanent solution to the huge amounts of debt. But I think you're, you're onto something. There, there's a bucket of money out there that isn't being used and, and could be used better. Um, yes, I, you mentioned the last solution for mm -hmm. the colleges and the universities. Skin and the game, yeah. They have their skin and the mm -hmm. well, as like a part or parcel of the debt. So what do you, do you have any ideas about how much that part is? Or you know, I, I haven't, I don't know that there's a magic number. It would have to be enough that universities care. And some universities, you know, they've got, they've got loads of money. Are they really going to care? Um, but it, so it, ha it does have to strike a balance. It has to be enough that universities care, but not so much that every school changes their standards and we're only going to let in students who get a four or five. I mean, we, we, do, we don't want... We don't want to go that far. Um, and there have actually, there have been bills in in Washington. They're not going anywhere right now because some of the bills 
sponsors are running for president, and so they're, they're kind of going off on other tangents right now. Um, but I think it, it would be, I think we would still put students on the hook for enough of their debt to make them care. You, you don't want students to not care whether they pay back their loans or not. You do still want them to have, they want, you want students to have skin in the game as well. Um, I mean, maybe 20% for universities might be a reasonable amount, but I, I don't think there's a magic number. So there are some people, most of them running for president, who want to have just total forgiveness of all student debt. Uh, having grown up in rural Georgia, I think that there may be some more purposeful means of having forgiveness of debt, provided you provide some service that's in high need, high demand. Have you done any research, research around, you know, what are the, the good ways to have debt forgiven in order to add value to communities? For, um, you mean for having student debt forgiven? Correct. So there are existing debt forgiveness programs for people who go into particular fields, mostly nonprofit fields and uh, government service. But because of the way federal grants and the, the former FFEL, so FFEL was a former grant program, then it changed into direct, which is a really silly, uh, wonky distinction to make. But because of the changes that the federal government made, they haven't been able to see how those programs would actually work. Because what happened is that a bunch of people who thought they were going to have their debt forgiven didn't actually get it forgiven. And that, that means that we, we don't know, really, how well it would have worked or how well it would work. Because it's, it's really impossible to track you know, what's going on and, and all of the ways it should have played out. Um, it certainly is an idea that has been, you know, it's been floated, it's, it's been put into practice really, really poorly. Um, and I think it would be a matter of, you know, is there any kind of consensus nationally about what are the kind of things we collectively think are, you know, valuable enough for debt forgiveness? And obviously we're really polarized right now. There might be a lot of disagreement about whether one uh, kind of job is, is worthy of debt forgiveness. So I'm, I, I hate to be as skeptical about politics as I am, but I don't even know if we could all agree at this point in time. You know, who, who, who gets to be forgiven and who doesn't if we're predicating it on some kind of you know, valuable service? But I, I definitely think that just forgiving it all regardless of anything is is a tragic waste of resources. We need that. We've got time for about two more I, You've had your hand up for a long time. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk about income sharing agreements. Yes. Not a lot of implementation. Mm -hmm. So what would you take on that? Yeah. I, I think that any university that wants to do income share agreements should do it right now. It's a great idea. And Purdue is doing it. And I am really excited to see how that works out. I don't know what it will mean to try to do that legislatively. I think skin in the game is a lot easier to do legislatively because it's all predicated on student loans, which come from the federal government anyway. So it's just the federal government regulating something it's already doing. Um, income share agreements, I think it, they probably work better if they come from individual institutions, but I'm, I'm willing to be convinced Otherwise, I mean, if somebody shows me a great bill of how this is how we're going to implement it nationwide, I'd, I'd love to see it, but I'm not sure that I've seen it yet. Yes. Uh, since we're limited on time, my question will be in three parts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about, how do we get away or get back to uh, some personal responsibility? And I don't, I don't mean this cynically. Uh, case in point. My, myself, my wife and I, uh, we put each other through school, okay, uh, and we knew that Harvard was out of the question. You know, we wound up going to a state university. 
But we got a good education. She became a very good gifted language arts teacher, and I became her spouse. So, <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, and we had a little bit of debt. As a matter of fact, my senior year, I took a three thousand dollar student loan out, and it took me a few years to pay it. But there was never a notion that I was going to default or not pay it back. So, mm -hmm. is that it? is that era gone? Where okay, I've got to limit my choices because of my social circumstances, and but yet if I go to graduate school after I improve, you know, get a whatever, you can still rise to to greatness. So whatever happened to that, or how do we get back you to know, that? I think you? that there has been a little <clears throat> bit of awareness that people should make different choices, and I'm seeing it because the interest in community college has soared. And community college is an affordable way to start, and there has been interest not only from students to start at a community college, but there's been interest on the part of some universities and performers to try to make sure that community colleges and universities work together so that that transfer from one to the other can be seamless, so that students can start responsibly at a place where they they know their debt's going to be manageable, where they can kind of test the waters to see how college is really going to go, and and then go to a university. And the reason I say that this is the new path is because even state colleges are really past the point where you can just work your way through. Tuition on top of room and board and books and fees it it's it's gotten it's gotten too expensive to work your way through it is it the availability of money in increasing tuition doesn't have that the same effect i i do believe that that's part of it we, you know we see that in all parts of the economy if you have if you have a third party payer and you increase the amount of money they'll increase tuition um, and i actually i wrote about that and looked at the available literature and I think there's, there's very good evidence that that's part of the problem. Um, but I think that yes, people are interested in being responsible. There should be more of them, but I'm very encouraged by what's going on at our community colleges right now. Yes. Oh, one more. We'll get it. We'll get Sorry. It. And then I, I think she's going to be able to stick around for I a while. Yes. So. We can do some one-on-one. -on -one. This, this is uh, somewhat of a tangent, but have you, have you in your research and your you know, reading and writing uh, come across arguments uh, surrounding international students matriculating the United States and how uh, universities are able to essentially double the price that they're paying and what effect that has on, uh, I don't want to say marginalizing, but driving away other students, you know, taking seats uh, from, you know, in-state students and how that affects the costs and sort of exacerbates this issue. Right. I mean, it's definitely true that universities charge not only international students, but out-of-state students yes. quite a bit more than the in-state tuition. Um, and I think we have seen that in some places where the university just says, we got to, you know, we got to get the revenues up by any means. And I think that if a state has committed to a university <laughs> system, they ought to put their state students first. And I am proud to be from North Carolina where we have a cap at our universities that um, no more than 18% of students at any UNC school can be from out of state. Um, that's only for undergraduate. That doesn't include graduate students. Um, but I do think that since taxpayers from that state are footing a large part of the bill that their, their kids should come first. That, that's, how the student, that's how the system was designed. Um, and so I think that there, there should be um, an awareness of the people who run university systems that to put their students first. Uh, but also not every state is in the happy position that North Carolina is that we're growing. Our population is increasing. And so we can fill those seats and then some. My own alma mater, NC State, has 89% of North Carolina students in its undergrad, undergraduate population. But if you're from a shrinking state where the population is declining, there are fewer young people, I, I don't know if that's possible. 
And so I wouldn't say every state should do exactly what North Carolina has done, because we're definitely benefiting from our population. Join me in thanking Jenna one more time.